As the youngest son of Basil the Macedonian, Alexander grew up without any expectation of ever being full emperor in his own right. He was associated with the throne of his brother Leo the Wise, but he never actually did anything or acted as emperor. However, because Leo had so many problems producing a son and heir, and even once he had a son and Constantine the boy was sickly, Alexander was never disassociated from the throne. Therefore, when Leo died in 912, Alexander ascended to become the full emperor. Over the next 13 months, he would rule the empire in what is a mostly forgotten and mostly embarrassing reign. So, today what I'd like to do is take a look at the reign such as it was of Alexander. Alexander was born in 870 as the son of Basil I and Eudocia in Garena. He was the fourth son of Basil, but he was the youngest of three sons that Basil had with Eudocia. Unlike Leo, who was born at such a time that he may have conceivably been the biological son of Michael III, Alexander's parentage was unquestioned simply because he was born a few years after Michael III had been assassinated. His early relationship with his father and brothers is undocumented, however, we know that he had plenty of beef with his brother Leo later in life. Alexander was officially crowned in 879. This was at a time when Basil had just lost his oldest son, Constantine, and he needed to make sure that his three younger sons were associated with the throne in case one or more of them did not make it to succeed him. However, as the youngest of these three, Alexander's title was more or less honorary, and he was there simply as a spare. In 886, Basil died in a hunting accident, and Leo ascended to the throne as the new senior emperor. Now, technically, Stephen and Alexander still shared in the throne. However, it was always understood that the oldest son would inherit all of the power. So, one of the first things that Leo does is to try to get a friend in the patriarch's seat. So, he appoints his second oldest brother, Stephen, as the patriarch. Stephen was fairly sickly, so this would give him an honorable position and give Leo an ally at least for a few years. Alexander, who was healthy, would remain as the heir apparent. Now, this of course gives Alexander nothing to actually do, and supposedly he became a raging alcoholic and spent all of his time partying and not really doing anything productive. However, we have to remember that our sources are entirely hostile to Alexander, and a large part of the reason why is because one of the most preeminent historians of the next generation was Leo's own son, Constantine VII, whom Alexander supposedly tried to have castrated at one point, so needless to say, he may have borne a grudge. Anyhow, it's possible that this is partly true about Alexander, that he was uninterested in government. After all, if you were just the spare, your brother would not really deal you into the government. That was not a norm in the Byzantine world. Um, moreover, Alexander was probably just frustrated and bored, and this was the only outlet that he had. This was the only thing he could possibly do unless he were of a more scholarly bent, which he does not seem to have been. Over time, Alexander and Leo grew to hate each other. The precise reasons are not clear. I imagine for Alexander, it was because he was sort of kept in this perpetual limbo state of having to be available as the heir apparent while not really having a great chance to succeed. Leo failed time and again to produce an heir, so Alexander's hopes would get up and then Leo would find a way to get another marriage. Um, for Leo's part, I guess Alexander's continuing existence and lack of productivity may have been offensive. I don't know exactly what it was, but the two of them clearly did not like each other. Um, also, fun fact, Alexander, to the best of my knowledge, was also very hard pressed to produce male heirs, um, and he does not seem to have ever had a son or even a daughter. So there may have been some fertility issues in that generation of the Macedonian dynasty that went beyond just Leo. While Leo's epithet, the wise, might lead you to believe that he must have been very popular and respected in his own time, there actually were a couple of different assassination attempts against his life. 
One of them happened back in 895 and may have involved Stiliana Sautzes, but another one happened in 903 at the Church of St. Masius. And while the details of this assassination plot are not clear, Alexander may have been involved in some way. In 904, just right after this plot, Alexander was temporarily deprived of his co-emperor status, but he was then reinstated the next year. There was no real reason to knock him out of his co-emperor status in 904 unless he were somehow implicated in this plot. At this time, Constantine had not been born, and Leo had no one else to turn to in the event of his death. And of course, by 904, Leo's health was beginning to slip some, so he needed to have an heir lined up in case the worst happened early. Now, when Constantine VII was born in 906, Alexander was still able to retain his status because Constantine suffered from legitimacy issues for reasons we talked about in my previous video on Leo, and he also followed the Macedonian tradition of not being very healthy. He was a sickly child, and it was far from clear that he would live to see adulthood. From May of 912 until June of 913, Alexander served as the senior emperor. Constantine was both his co-ruler and his heir apparent. By the time he came to power, Alexander was already 41 years old, and he was already in poor health due to years of alcohol abuse, at least according to the sources. It's also simply possible that he was in poor health for the same reasons as Leo, i.e. disease and maybe some bad genetics. As I mentioned earlier, Alexander had no children, but now that he was on the throne, he became much more concerned with siring his own heir to make sure that his branch of the Macedonian dynasty became the one that endured. There are hostile accounts about him dabbling with pagan fertility gods in the Hippodrome, and in these accounts, the reason for Alexander being so obsessive is that he was trying to restore his worn-out genitals and teeth, and there is basically just an extended dick joke about how Alexander's stuff doesn't work anymore. However, I suspect that the real concern that he had was over his own infertility, rather than impotence. Um, he now was in a position where he could actually produce an, a son who might have a chance to become something rather than just languish in obscurity as an imperial cousin. At one point, Alexander was so bent on this scheme that he considered having Constantine castrated so that he would no longer be eligible for the throne, but he was talked out of it. Now, of course, the source accounts, which owe a lot to Constantine, portray this as complete insanity, but there's a certain logic to what Alexander is doing. He's trying to move on from his brother's legacy, and he is also trying to play up the sentiment that Constantine was conceived illegitimately because he came from a fourth marriage and began life as a child born out of wedlock to Leo's live-in mistress. So there actually were political motivations that could have driven Alexander to consider something like this. That being said, it was still an ill-conceived idea since Constantine was really the only Macedonian male other than Alexander himself who could have held power. But at any rate, there's no reason to think that Alexander was a completely hopeless alcoholic or a raging lunatic. He very clearly was not the smartest guy in the world, but he's not completely out of his mind. When Alexander came to the throne, he decided to undo many of the policies that Leo VI had pursued. And while our sources portray his moves as being simply driven by his hatred of his late brother, I would argue that Alexander actually needed to do some of these moves in order to secure support for his reign. He had very little public profile as someone who more or less stayed in the palace and drank all day, and he needed to show that he had energy and vision and also some kind of moral fiber. So the first move that he made was to banish Zoe Carbonopsina from the palace, thus showing that he regarded his brother's fourth marriage and all the moves that he had made to pull it off as illegitimate. This, of course, was in the signal to the church that he was going to be someone who would uphold the rights of Constantinople against Rome, 
and it would enable him to further ingratiate himself with the church in his area. Furthermore, by banishing Zoe from the palace, he made sure that his seven-year-old nephew would not really be able to use his throne in any meaningful way and would be consigned to a non-existent role as a spare. So this would give him much more direct control and no pushback from within. If we think back to the problem of the Tetragami, Leo's fourth marriage, what had happened is that to resolve the issue and get his fourth marriage acknowledged, Leo effectively had to abandon his lifelong commitment to the Photian faction, which had been prominent during his reign, and embrace the Ignatian faction. So Alexander naturally decides that he wants to embrace the Photians and get rid of the Ignatians. Alexander declared that Leo's deposition of Nicholas Mysticus had been illegitimate, so he recalled and reinstated Nicholas as patriarch. And what this does is it turns this boiling factional feud that had been sort of dying out over the last five years into more or less a full-blown civil war. Now, when he came to power, uh, banished Zoe from the palace, and indicated that he was a champion of the Eastern Church, Alexander put himself in a position to ingratiate himself with everyone in the church, but instead he decided to play a partisan game, and this was less than wise. And ultimately, it would require cooler heads to prevail and prevent this from becoming a complete catastrophe. Now, one of those people who was not among the cooler heads was Nicholas Mysticus. He had been in exile for five years, and when he came back, he was brewing with bitterness and driven only by a desire for revenge. Um, again, keep in mind when we talk about any of these prominent bishops, all of these guys come from aristocratic houses. They all have massive egos, and they do not brook insults or dishonor very well. Just like when Erethus had a hate boner for Nicholas, Nicholas came back and he wanted to eliminate Euthemius, Erethus, and all the rest. So Nicholas proposed putting Euthemius on trial and completely purging the church of Ignatians and positions of authority, meaning getting rid of every bishop who was an Ignatian, and at that time that would have been around two-thirds of the sitting bishops. And he came to Alexander with this plan, and Alexander signed off on it. He said, I, as the emperor, will support your efforts. So Nicholas proceeded to try to do just that, to get rid of all the Ignatians in the church. The underlying flaw in the plan that Nicholas and Alexander hatched is that they simply did not have the cumulative prestige between them or the support base to completely purge the church of one of its major factions. Even had they been a much better respected and established emperor and patriarch, they could not have pulled this off, most likely. Nicholas's revenge efforts ended up leading to a literal mutiny of the church and a breakdown of authority where bishops refused to acknowledge his orders. The main thing that really stood out as a symbol of Nicholas's overreach was during his trial of Euthymius, where he authorized a physical beating of the former patriarch by a giant and then banished him into exile. This was seen as just petty and a complete abuse of power. It really undermined Nicholas's claims to be acting for a higher cause or a higher authority. Shortly after the trial, where he thought that by getting the verdict he had sought that his position was vindicated, Nicholas had issued an order that all Ignatian bishops were to vacate their sees. However, they refused, and they were led in this by the eloquence of Erethus, who was still an Ignatian and still an enemy of Nicholas because of some stuff that had happened in 900. Nicholas backed down at this time, Probably he had already figured out that this was not going to work, and instead he contented himself with only sacking four Ignatian bishops, probably going after some fairly small fries. He certainly didn't get Erethus, and then with a few other guys he was able to move them around to lateral promotions, 
what exactly that accomplished, I'm not sure, but maybe it just reestablished the idea that the patriarch has that authority. Anyway, of course, his reform of the church ended up being a complete catastrophe, and this back down by Nicholas actually occurred a little bit after Alexander's death. Meanwhile, in secular affairs, Alexander was looking for another way to distinguish himself from his late brother. One of the biggest embarrassments of Leo's reign was his defeat at the hands of Simeon I of the Bulgarian Empire. So Alexander decided that he needed to change course in Byzantine relations with the Bulgarians. So Simeon sent an embassy to Alexander to congratulate him on his succession and to request the renewal of the Treaty of 901, which included a generous tribute from Byzantium to the Bulgarians. At the time when he received this request, Alexander was supposedly drunk, and the request really did not sit well with him. So he rejected the Bulgarian embassy and stated that he had no interest in treaties or tribute. Simeon predictably resolved upon war early in 913, but because invasions take a long time to plan and execute, he, this invasion actually only occurred a month or two after Alexander's death in June of 913, meaning that he started one of the longer wars that the Byzantines fought and then participated in it not at all. This war was called the Byzantine-Bulgarian War of 913 to 927. In case you haven't noticed, most Byzantine wars do not have what we might call good names. To revert to the question that I posed in the subtitle on the title screen, is Alexander completely useless or merely the victim of smears? As I pointed out, Constantine VII was one of the major influencers of the historical tradition and he clearly had a bone to pick with his late uncle. However, I think that while Constantine is clearly biased, his bias is completely justified, both in terms of being bitter for the right reasons and in terms of recognizing that Alexander's actions were to the detriment of the empire as a whole. So let's look at what Alexander's legacy was. So when he died, Alexander appointed Nicholas Mysticus, the patriarch, to be the guardian for Constantine VII. The problem is that there was a clear conflict of interest as Nicholas, while patriarch for the first time, had tried his damnedest to prevent Constantine's legitimacy from being accepted. So this meant that Nicholas would immediately start shopping around for replacement emperors. And this effectively led to a conflict between Leo's widow Zoe, Nicholas, and a host of prominent generals jockeying for authority over Constantine the Seventh. And in fact, this would go on for so long that Constantine the Seventh would not rule in his own right until he was 45 years old, the same age as his father when he died. Alexander played a pivotal role, probably the pivotal role, in setting Byzantium up for 14 years of war against the Bulgarian Empire. It's also possible that Simeon chose that moment to strike simply because he knew that with Leo gone and either Alexander or a child on the throne, Byzantium would have a lot of trouble repelling another attack and that he could carve up more territory in the Balkans. At any rate, whatever Alexander's intentions may have been, the fact remains he was a god-awful emperor, he was completely incompetent, and his actions weakened the Byzantine Empire and threatened to bring the Macedonian dynasty itself to an end, as Constantine was almost deposed by some of the generals who would rule in his name. In 905, after many years of trying, Leo VI finally sired a son, Constantine. Although the boy was sickly, Leo was determined to bend heaven and earth in order to legitimize his new son and pass the empire on to him. If he had lived long enough to allow his son to reach adulthood, Leo no doubt could have smoothed out the civil war that he started within the church in order to promote his son's legitimacy. However, Leo died in 912 and then left the throne to his brother Alexander. Alexander turned out to be not terribly competent 
and also had no heirs of his own, so he was forced to leave Constantine as his heir. Alexander duly proceeds to start a war with Bulgaria and then die before the war really begins. So what this means is that you have a seven-year-old emperor and there's a scramble for power to control the empire in his name. Some of the actors who will emerge do not act in good faith and they intend to undermine and replace this young emperor whose legitimacy they reject on the grounds that Leo should not have been allowed to have a fourth marriage. On the other hand, you have supporters of Constantine, such as his mother Zoe, and then you have other people who really don't care about the marriage issue, but they just want to have some power. And what we have is a seven-year stretch, which I think deserves its own video, since the political dynamics within this age are unique and different than what we would normally think of as being the reign of any normal Byzantine emperor, such as a normal emperor exists. So let's look at the years 913 to 920, the time when regents ruled Byzantium. In 913, the prospects of Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus did not look terribly promising. Although he was now the sole heir to the throne and the officially recognized senior emperor, he had a rough life ahead of him in the next several years, at least politically speaking. His dying uncle Alexander had previously excluded his mother Zoe from the palace, and while Zoe was able to sneak back into the palace before Alexander passed, what ends up happening is that Alexander and his will had named a council of regency, and he had deliberately excluded Zoe Carbonopsina from that council of regency. Normally, if you have a widow who has a young son on the throne, she will be included on the Council of Regency to ensure that her child's best interests are looked after and also that the child is raised properly. However, she was excluded and that was up to this time an unprecedented snub. The Council of Regency was headed by Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, who was an opponent of Constantine coming to the throne. He had opposed Leo's fourth marriage and still believed that fourth marriages were impious and should not be allowed. And not only did he hold that belief, but he also had lost his seat over it and had suffered exile. After that exile, he had famously tortured his um, successor Euthemius, and that had earned him some infamy. Despite the fact that he had taken out his vengeance on Euthemius, Nicholas Mysticus was still full of rage, and he would continue to pose a problem to the Macedonian dynasty. There was already an invasion underway from Bulgaria when Alexander died in the summer. I mentioned this just previously. And this invasion was caused because while Leo VI had been willing to pay a heavy tribute to Simeon and the Bulgarians, his successor Alexander reversed course and said he had no interest in paying this tribute. Well. Simeon was on the march to Constantinople and looking to collect. So immediately the new regent Nicholas Mysticus would face a major military crisis. However, before that crisis would break out, there were some more domestic issues for him to consider. The politics of the years between 913 and 920 are somewhat complicated and I think that it might be useful to just lay out who the major players during this period were, just to make sure that this is all a little bit clearer to listeners who may be a bit fuzzy or rusty on the reigns of the previous two emperors. One of the major players throughout this period will be Simeon I the Great of Bulgaria. He had done quite a bit to reduce Leo's standing in the world and Byzantine control in the Balkans and he would continue to haunt Leo's child. Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, we mentioned above, was an adamant opponent of Leo's fourth marriage and therefore sought his redemption by trying to get rid of Constantine VII, whose reign he saw as something of an abomination. Constantine Ducas was the son of Andronicus Ducas, who had defected to the Abbasid Caliphate or one of the smaller emirates during the previous reign of Leo VI. Constantine was now the head of a, one of the most powerful families in Byzantium. It was a military aristocratic clan stationed in Anatolia, 
and he had designs on the throne, designs that were supported by Nicholas Mysticus. The Empress Zoe Carbonopsina, of course, will fight strongly to preserve her son's birthright, and she will be one of the most important figures during this period, despite facing clear advantages as a woman and as a woman who was born outside of the imperial family. Leo Phocas is a major general during this period. He is the son of the famous Nicephorus Phocas, who won great fame in Italy and Sicily back in the 880s. And last but not least, the Admiral Romanus Lecapinus will also play a great role during this period. Now that he was the regent of the state, the number one priority for the patriarch Nicholas Mysticus was to firmly entrench his own authority and eliminate any potential challengers. This is especially important because now he was facing the context of a great war of Bulgaria, which would involve a large army camped outside of his walls in the very near future. So his first move was to force Zoe Carbonopsina to be shorn and then to take holy vows as Sister Anna. Why they chose the name Anna for her, I'm not entirely sure. She was then sent off to a convent. Now with Zoe off the scene, Nicholas was the chief power in the state. Not accepting Euthemius's dispensation to legitimize Constantine VII, Nicholas then began to communicate with Constantine Ducas, the son of Andronicus Ducas, about the possibility of Constantine assuming the throne. Constantine actually had quite a few things going for him as a candidate. He was an experienced general. He came from the most powerful family in Byzantium outside of the Macedonian house itself. And he already had two sons, so he had a clear line of succession. There would not be any question of him needing to engage in a fourth marriage or any other hijinks like that. So it looked like a pretty elegant solution. This, of course, would also put an emperor in the debt of Nicholas, who wanted to enhance the patriarch's powers. And it all seemed like a pretty good plan. I do have to mention, of course, that it is not 100% proven that Nicholas and Constantine were actually in league, but it seems rather likely. Despite his family's origins in Anatolia, at the time of the coup in 913, Constantine Ducas was stationed in Thrace, and he took ahead an advance guard and made for Constantinople. His goal was to enter the city quietly and then pull off his coup using the element of surprise. However, apparently someone leaked out word of his arrival, and one of the men on the Regency Council, named John Alatus, learned about Ducas's approach and met him at one of the city gates as he was entering by night. Duke um, Alatus was able to gather together a small force of men, and there was a small but bloody street battle in the middle of the night. During this battle, the key results were that Constantine lost, but the key deaths here were Constantine's oldest son, Gregory, and then Constantine himself. What happened to him, supposedly, is that his horse tripped, he was dumped unceremoniously on the pavement, and one of his opponents managed to slice his head off while he was down. So this clearly puts an end to Constantine Ducas's coup, and also to any chance of there being a Ducas emperor within the near future. Although the coup failed, it did present an unexpected challenge to a dynasty that had ruled for almost 50 years, and one can imagine that the public was deeply uneasy. Many people probably wondered who had been working with Constantine and who had helped him to get into the city. Well, this meant that accusations were hurled back and forth, and Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus seems to have been concerned that people would think that he was involved. In fact, there were rumors to that effect. So, in order to head off this kind of suspicion, the Patriarch denounced in the firmest possible terms this coup and vehemently denied that he had anything to do with it. And in order to prove that he was unaffiliated with this coup, he ordered severe penalties for anyone who was even suspected of being complicit in any way. 
there were whole units of the Byzantine army that were expect that were suspected of having pro Dukas sentiments that were massacred en masse. Some men were blinded or flogged. Dukas's younger son, who seems to have been a child, was castrated. And then the bodies of the people Nicholas had found guilty were impaled along the Asiatic shore of the Bosphorus in order to deter further attempts to challenge the throne. Of course, if Nicholas actually were uninvolved, what this would mean is that he saw Constantine as trying to challenge his authority and that he was just replying with a vengeance to once again establish his authority and make sure that he would remain as regent going forward as long as he desired. This reign of terror only ended when the other members of the Regency Council complained to Nicholas about him going too far and how his actions were unnecessary. Eventually he relented and this mini reign of terror finally ended. Right around the time that Nicholas's purge was ending, this is when Simeon and his Bulgarian army finally arrive at the gates of Constantinople. Simeon, like many invaders from Europe, found that Constantinople's walls were impenetrable. However, he could still be quite a menace by laying waste to the countryside and threatening the empire's European possessions such as Thessalonica or Adrianople. However, he could not seize the city or starve it out, so there was something of an impasse. Nicholas, for his part, was still concerned primarily with securing his own power, and therefore he wanted to make peace as quickly as possible in order to get Simeon out of the empire. Also, it appears that Nicholas was obsessed with the issue of the Bulgarian church possibly switching its allegiance to Rome, and he didn't want to lose the Bulgarian church from the eastern orbit. So this was a bargaining ship that Simeon could play. Now, over the next few days or weeks, Nicholas will meet with Simeon's two sons in a preliminary meeting. They will establish a kind of friendship and rapport. And then Simeon met with um, Nicholas in person, and the two of them were able to hash out an agreement. One of the major problems with this agreement right up front is that more or less Nicholas just agreed to it without consulting anyone on the Regency Council or any of the other major officials in the state, which, as you might imagine, caused quite a bit of butthurt and backlash. The agreement that Nicholas Mysticus made with Simeon was for the Byzantine Empire to pay the arrears of the tribute that was created when Alexander had failed to renew the treaty. Additionally, and probably more importantly, Constantine VII was to be engaged to one of Simeon's daughters, meaning that the next emperor of Byzantium would be the grandson of Simeon of Bulgaria. Simeon then went home loaded with gifts. Now, for some of the reasons outlined above, namely that Nicholas overreached and did not consult any of his fellow regents when making this deal, there was quite a bit of backlash. Needless to say, a lot of people were also not happy that one of their greatest enemies would soon be the father-in-law of their emperor, especially when this foreign monarch, Simeon, was such a power in the world. He was one of the greatest monarchs of that era, and his power had only been growing. So before we get to the great backlash within Constantinople, I would first like to consider the motives of both Nicholas and Simeon, because I think that this is an interesting debate. John Julius Norwick claims that Simeon was aiming for the Byzantine crown, and that he knew that he could, could manipulate Nicholas because of Nicholas's concern for the Bulgarian church possibly entering the Western orbit. I think that Norwick overestimates the religious element here, but also I think that he's relying too heavily on Simeon's adoption of the terms Basileus, which is the Greek term for king or in the Byzantine period emperor, and his use of the term czar, which is a Slavic translation of Caesar, and he is making way too much of these two words. My interpretation is that Nicholas's main concern was just getting Simeon to go home so that he could keep consolidating his power. I think that he was willing to make these concessions in order to get Simeon off of his back and buy time. 
I don't know what his long-term intentions actually were. As for Simeon, I think that he wanted a quick payday. He had other frontiers we need to remember. And that the adoption of these titles like Tsar and Basileus was more about the long-term advancement and development of the power of the Bulgarian state and crown. I don't think that he necessarily wanted to take over the Byzantine Empire full stop, as Norwich seems to believe. But again, the evidence is not complete, and both my interpretation and that of John Julius Norwich are merely that, interpretations that cannot ever be quite fully proven. If Nicholas Mysticus had only been vaguely accused of being an affiliate of Constantine Dukas, or if he had only engaged in cruelty, or if he had only made a shameful deal with Simeon, he probably could have bounced back from the, each one of these crises separately. However, as it happens, this threefold failing on his part caused all of the fellow members of the Council of Regency to lose all faith in him and demand that he step down as regent. To replace him, the council recalled the Empress Zoe, reinstating her in her imperial authority, and then placed her over the council. This only after eight months of Patriarch Nicholas's guidance. The Patriarch, for his part, was able to retain his see but for the next several years, he wisely stayed out of politics since he had exposed himself as someone who was not really fit for governance. Zoe then reappoints many of her old friends and allies from Leo's day, and many of these people were eunuchs. The new Tsar of Bulgaria, Simeon, would dub this government a government of eunuchs. However, this government would prove to be quite effective and in fact, Zoe would soon become a very popular regent and earn a spot as one of the greatest women in Byzantine history. In fact, her reputation is such that one modern author actually adopted her name as her pen name when she wrote a book about some lady with terminal cancer who apparently becomes a vigilante killer of some kind. I haven't actually read the book. I'm just assuming that's what it's about based on a little blurb I read on Amazon and the cover art. The first major foreign policy crisis that the new regent Zoe would face came in Armenia. To give a very simplified version of a complex issue, Armenia had long been a buffer zone between Byzantium and the Abbasid Caliphate with neither side in complete control. There was a fair deal of local autonomy and Armenia had its own distinctive political culture. However, both Byzantium and the Abbasids controlled quite a bit within the empire and helped to really control who was on the throne and what policies the Armenians held. Anyhow, um, the Persian governor, Emir Yusuf, decided to break the balance of power by helping to spark a series of civil wars in 909 and then taking advantage of the chaos that these wars created, he was able to sweep across the country and bring much of it under his personal control. In 913, the Armenian king, Sumbat, decided to surrender to Yusuf in order to end the bloodshed, apparently thinking that he would be granted some reduced role in the state, or at the very least his life, but Yusuf decided to have him eliminated entirely. By 914, Sumbat's son Ashat decided to travel to Constantinople in order to petition for aid. And this is where Zoe comes in because by now she was the regent and she was sympathetic to Ashat's plight. During the winter of 914 to 915, Zoe and Ashat worked out a plan for Ashat to reclaim Armenia. This was important to Zoe because the Abbasids were a Muslim power and she saw this as a potential threat to the balance of power between Byzantium and the Abbasid Caliphate. While the Abbasid Caliphate was losing a lot of its coherence and its ability to really threaten the Byzantines, it was still a major power and it was sort of the only real great rival of the Byzantines in the East. In the spring of 915, a large Byzantine army moved into Armenia in order to help reinstall a shot. Yusuf fought back fiercely, however, he was massively outnumbered. The Byzantine army in the east was well organized, well run, and large. 
By the beginning of winter, a shot had secured all of western and much of eastern Armenia, meaning that Yusuf was more or less limited to marginal lands and the mountains in the east. However, Yusuf was resourceful and managed to hold out for four more years. However, by 919, Ashat was now fully king, and the land was once again unified under a single monarch. While one major Byzantine army was away in Armenia, one of the emirs based in Tarsus decided to risk a major invasion of Byzantium from Tarsus. In the reign of Leo VI, Tarsus had been reduced and the emirate there had collapsed. However, it seems to have recovered by this time in order for the local powers there to launch an invasion. However, while this invasion probably had a reasonably good chance of success given how many men Zoe committed to the Armenian expedition, that was not the case. In fact, Byzantine forces managed to more or less completely destroy this invasion force and this victory was considered great enough to cause celebrations in the capital. And while those celebrations were going on, other really good news arrived from a different quarter of the empire. In Italy, things had not been going well for a while. In Leo's time, the Byzantines had been finally kicked out of Sicily once and for all, and now Arab forces were advancing into Italy. However, the momentum shifted in 915, when near the city of Capua in the theme of Langobardia, imperial forces were able to completely destroy an advancing Arab army, and this helped to restore Byzantine power and prestige in Italy, and it restored it to its greatest extent since Nicephorus Phocas's tenure back in the 880s. So this was quite a formidable pair of victories, and you can imagine that this did quite a bit to really boost Zoe's popularity to unseen heights. Now that she had won a great deal of prestige in both the far west of her empire and on the eastern frontier in two different places, Zoe felt powerful, confident, and popular enough to challenge Simeon and to try to set things right on that front. Supposedly, she was horrified at the prospect of her son marrying a barbarian princess, and the sources sometimes make it out like this was a type of prejudice, and it may very well have been that in part. However, most likely, it was really a horror at the possibility of her son being influenced by Simeon or of having one of the future monarchs of the Bulgarian state having a claim to the Byzantine throne. So, um, what Zoe does is she decides that the marriage between her son and one of Simeon's daughters cannot occur, and she officially renounces and breaks the engagement. Now, Simeon obviously does not take this well. That had been one of the major concessions that Nicholas had given him, and he was willing to fight for it. So, this news came to him in fairly late in 915, and in September, he decided to send sort of a half-hearted last-minute invasion to cap off the year, and he advanced to Adrianople in Thrace, which immediately surrendered. His plan seems to have been to winter in Thrace and then get heavy reinforcements and then go to Constantinople. However, this didn't end up happening because Zoe retaliated unexpectedly by sending a major force to retake the city. And Simeon, who didn't want to be on the wrong side of the Danube when winter hit, decided to flee. By late 915, Zoe was immensely popular as she not only had won two major battlefield victories and put an ally on the throne in Armenia, but had also inflicted a humiliation upon Simeon, who had been owning the Byzantines for over 20 years at this point. So it had sort of become an annual thing that Simeon would do some mischief to the Byzantines, and now Zoe had finally put her foot down and done something about it. So you can imagine just how beloved she would have been at that moment. The near disaster in 915 made Simeon a bit more cautious. So in 916, he contented himself with merely raiding, and this policy would continue into 917. 
So mostly he was just launching fairly small scale attacks into Thessaly and Epirus, and he wasn't mounting any major offensives that would constitute any kind of real risk taking. However, in 917, he was concentrating his armies in Thrace once again. Rather than wait for Simeon to arrive near Constantinople, Zoe decided to act boldly once again and strike first with a giant pincer movement which would hopefully inflict a major defeat on Simeon and undo a lot of the damage that the Empire had suffered under her husband when he had lost a huge chunk of the Balkans to Simeon. The strategy was actually a pretty sound one, and it possibly could have worked had it actually gone as planned. The Strategos at Cherson in the Crimea, John Bogos, was able to hire a large force of Pechenegs, who would then be ferried across the Danube by the Byzantine fleet. Meanwhile, Leo Phocas, the son of Nicephorus, would advance along the Black Sea coast. Between them, they would then entrap Simeon and hopefully inflict a major defeat or force him to make some concessions, such as dropping his demand for the wedding and maybe giving up a bit of territory. The reason why Zoe's grand pincer didn't end up working out is because the northern arm of that pincer never actually materialized. Now, John Bogos, the Strategos of Cherson, did indeed raise this Pechenig force, and the Drungarius Romanus Lycopinus did indeed take his fleet up to the Danube. However, the two of them were unable to cooperate with one another. And the reason for their failure to cooperate was over rank, seniority, and a sort of status dispute among members of the upper echelons of the elite. So this feud is interesting because what it shows is the rising prestige of the office of Drungarius and their rise vis-a-vis -vis the strategoi of Byzantium who had previously been the senior officials outside of people like the domestic of the schools or the emperor himself. So John Bogos was probably from a very uh, well-connected aristocratic family and he also had a social prejudice against Romanus Lecopinus, who came from much humbler origins. Also in general, in antiquity and in the Middle Ages, land operations were seen as more prestigious and more honorable than sea operations. So Bogos, for that reason, would be very reluctant to submit to the authority of Romanus. And for his part, Romanus felt like it was an affront to him to have his authority questioned because he happened to not be born into a certain household, even though he clearly had earned some imperial favor at some point if he were entrusted with his current office. So both of them had reasons to feel aggrieved here. And in the end, both of them failed to actually do their duty and produce the expected results. And Romanus, of course, was the guy who was ultimately on the hook for this since it was his responsibility to get the Pechenegs to the southern bank of the Danube. And his refusal to move them until Bogos would bow to his authority and agree to follow his orders during the crossing meant that the Pechenegs, who were mercenaries, got tired of waiting and felt like they'd already made a little bit of money and they weren't going to get any plunder soon, so they just started to drift away, and the army disintegrated. So this was literally a case of an aristocratic dick measuring contest completely wrecking an imperial operation. The real problem is that without the northern pincer, this meant that Leo Phocas was on his own, and he does not seem to have realized that he was on his own. He advanced from the south into Bulgar territory along the Black Sea, and then he bivouacked near the small port of Anchialis. On August 20th, Simeon, who had approached him unseen, pounced on the Byzantines from the nearby hills to the west. The Byzantines seemed to have been caught off guard while in their camp. Leo was supposedly taking a bath, and the attack caused his horse to panic, and it bolted from its stable and rode around the camp riderless but it was recognizable, and because the horse was without a rider, his men assumed that Leo had died, 
and this helped to really spread the panic. Romanus's fleet, rather than being nearby to support the army with supplies or transport or potential extraction, had actually retreated all the way back to the capital, which meant that now the survivors were pinned against the coast with no ships to go to. And the defeat of this army at Anchialis was more or less complete. A century later, Leo the Deacon said that the bleached bones of the men who had fallen at Anchialis were still visible all over the battlefield, even in his time. As you might well imagine, when Zoe heard some of the details of why the northern pincer of her great attack did not materialize, this really pissed her off, especially when she then got news of the catastrophe at Anchialis, which was one of the greatest defeats in recent memory. So accordingly, she ordered a board of inquiry to look into Romanus's conduct during this campaign. A lot of things were going against Romanus in this board of inquiry. If you really think about it, even though the dispute between Romanus and John Bogos had been over rank and privilege, at least John had something on his side that was key. Not only would the prejudice of the men judging the inquiry be on his side, since they would most likely be high-ranking aristocrats who might have seen Romanus as an upstart, but more importantly, John Bogos had a sort of reasonable explanation he could possibly throw out there in order to throw the scent off him being a dick. And that is that he could claim that he was afraid that if he relinquished authority to Romanus, that his Pechenig mercenaries might see this as a breach of their contract and agreement. So at least he could pretend that there was some deeper reason or some more practical reason for his refusal to cooperate with Romanus's demands. For Romanus, it was clearly a matter of pride and prejudice. And that doesn't appear good when, um, you know, you're held responsible in part for one of the greatest disasters in living memory. So the Empress was duly impressed with the board's findings and decided to have Romanus blinded. But at the last minute, some of his friends, he apparently did have friends in high places, were able to secure a last minute reprieve and Romanus was actually retained as Drungarius, even though one can imagine that Zoe was still quite suspicious of him and would never really hold him in the same regard ever again. The failure of Romanus Lycopinus to get the northern half of the army across the Danube in order to complete the pincer meant that in Zoe's eyes, Leo Phocas most likely had not been an abject failure despite the fact that he had presided over a horrific defeat at Anchialis. Leo himself was one of the few men to escape from the catastrophe and he did so by fleeing north to the port of Mesembria and then catching a ship back to the capital. When he arrived, Zoe gave him a second army and ordered him to protect Constantinople from Simeon's advance. In fairness to Leo, this army was most likely composed of a hastily recruited group of men, and they would not have been of the highest quality. In the winter of 917, Leo decided to challenge the Bulgarians in the western suburbs of Constantinople, and once again his army was completely and totally smashed. This implies that quite a bit of what happened at Anchialis might have actually been Leo's fault all along, and that Zoe was correct to not blind Romanus for the failure, since most likely if Leo was this bad of a general, he would have found a way to bungle even if the northern arm of the pincer had appeared. The events of 917 completely undid all of the gains that Zoe had made, in advancing her legitimacy as regent, and more or less her regime was in ruins by the start of 918. Unwilling to make peace with Simeon since she found his terms unacceptable, the Empress resolved to find an internal prop for her flagging prestige. And as someone who was a widow, she could remarry, or she could also seek out political allies and put them on the board of regents with her. The two most prominent men of this period were Leo Phocas and Romanus Lycopinus. As I've already discussed, Romanus Lycopinus was someone who was not of high birth, at least by the standards of the upper nobility, and he was also someone 
who clearly couldn't quite be trusted since she had just almost had him blinded. So giving him power slightly after that would not have been a great idea. However, while Leo was clearly not the best general, he was a widower. He came from a noble Anatolian family with lands, money, and prestige. And he apparently was a very attractive man. So Zoe began to make arrangements for the two of them to be married. And this will create quite a bit of backlash since this could potentially be seen as a threat to Constantine, who is now nearing adulthood. By 918, Constantine the Seventh was already 13 years old and just two years removed from attaining his majority and therefore his right to rule in his own name. While he was still sickly, he had already emerged as a prodigy and it was clear to everyone that he definitely had the mind to rule the empire. Constantine's tutor, Theodore, was convinced that Leo, if he were to marry Zoe, would really threaten his pupil's prestige and possibly even the throne itself. So accordingly, he decided to write a letter to Romanus in Constantine's name, seeking Romanus's protection. Norwick, I think, has a reasonable interpretation of Theodore's actions. He says that Theodore thought that Romanus's relatively humble origins would prevent him from challenging Constantine's position and that he would be merely a prop to the regime. However, um, if Theodore did think this, I think that he was engaging in some fairly fallacious and wishful thinking, since it was none other than Constantine's own grandfather, Basil I the Macedonian, who had come from humble origins to establish a dynasty. So, um, if this was Theodore's thinking, it was quite flawed. However, given what people usually thought about um, the prestige of a family name in this period, it is not unreasonable. Plus, um, as an Anatolian aristocrat, um, Leo Phocas was someone who would have quite a bit of land and money at his disposal, things that Romanus Lycopinus didn't have. So he did seem like more of a legitimate threat. By this point, Zoe had clearly identified Romanus Lycopinus as the greatest threat to her power, and she sent an order for him to disband his fleet. However, Romanus refused to vacate his command and drove off her messengers with rocks. These messengers then came back to Zoe, and she decided to summon an emergency council of her ministers in order to figure out what to do. However, when she arrived at this meeting, she found that they had lost all faith in her and they had decided that her time as regent was over. Her son Constantine read a prepared statement which officially ended her regency. These new powers that be in the state decided that she needed to go back into the convent. However, while she was being hauled off, Constantine the Seventh was able to win over people's sympathy and get her to not be sent back as Sister Anna, but to live in the palace, albeit without power. So Constantine the Seventh was starting to assert himself a little bit. However, he was still a minor and still couldn't really influence events. I seriously doubt that he actually wanted to remove his mother from the regency. The patriarch, Nicholas Mysticus, was called once again to fill the void and serve as regent, and his colleague would be Stephen, who had also served on the first council of regency that had been led by Nicholas. And while they were in nominal control, the real struggle was between Leo Phocas and Romanus Lycopinus. So for Leo, his marriage prospects to Zoe had been ruined by Zoe's removal from the scene. And for Romanus, now he faced um, not only Leo, but also Nicholas, who was trying to carve out his own path once again. So it was a three-way race, but the third member, the guy who was nominally in charge, was relatively irrelevant. As regent, Nicholas was in a position where he could potentially undermine his two main rivals or potentially play them off of one another or side with one of them against the other. But instead of doing that like a competent politician, he handled the entire thing ineptly as he always did when he dealt with politics. 
and he ended up making himself irrelevant. With Nicholas not accomplishing anything and with Leo languishing, Romanus took his fleet, sailed up to the Bacallian palace, entered, and then declared simply that he was taking over the regency. Most likely Theodore or some of the other pro-Romanist people at court invited him and he simply arrived, took over, and started doing things. It's even possible that young Constantine was in favor of Romanus because his tutor was, and maybe Theodore had succeeded in convincing Constantine of the wisdom of siding with Romanus. In April, Constantine VII married Romanus's daughter Helena, and Romanus was given the title of Basiliopater. This was a title previously used by Stilianos Zautzes, who had been the father-in-law of Leo VI. So, what Romanus is trying to do here by taking this title is to refer back to a tradition in the previous reign where you had this powerful figure at the side of the emperor who was in many ways effectively the wielder of the emperor's power, but this was something that had not really been seen as sinister back then, so Romanus's hope was that no one would regard it as sinister now. At the time that Romanus was able to take over the palace and simply name himself regent. Leo was at Chrysopolis on the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus, and he did not take this news lying down. In fact, he decided to raise the standard of revolt and start gathering men in order to save Constantine from the usurper, or to put it more honestly, to claim the regency for himself and possibly then prove to be a usurper in his own right. At any rate, Romanus, rather than fighting Leo head-on, had a better plan. He sent two emissaries into camp with a letter from Constantine that denounced Leo's actions, and since this letter was by an emperor who was approaching manhood and who was known to be smart, the men in the camp assumed that this letter represented Constantine's free will and his reasoned judgment. The two people tasked with carrying this letter were a priest and a prostitute, both of whom would be common sights in any army camp. People want to pray for their souls and also alleviate their earthly needs. The priest was quickly found out and he was detained and Leo thought therefore he had contained the threat of this letter. However, the prostitute went about unnoticed and kept spreading the news until most of Leo's men had heard the word and they began to lay down their arms and desert. When he felt like he was now in danger of being arrested by some of his own men, Leo decided to flee east, but he was caught in Bithynia, and then the men who caught him in their zealotry decided to blind him. This is something that Romanus had not ordered, and he apparently was furious that Leo had been blinded. It's not really clear exactly why he was so furious that his rival was blinded, but most likely it may have been because he was a little bit sensitive to the issue of blinding since he had almost lost his eyes after Anchialus. It's also simply possible that he thought that he people were being a little too independent and that they needed to seek the regent's approval before doing anything like that. Whatever Romanus's reasons for being angry about Leo being blinded, the fact is that blind men do not usurp thrones so Romanus had effectively eliminated his most potent rival. By the summer of 920, Romanus was the chief power in the state, and now the only real threat was that in a few months Constantine would turn 15 and thereby end the regency and Romanus's power with it. So what Romanus needed to do was to legitimately establish himself while diminishing Constantine and also making key allies that could support him. And he does this in a rather brilliant way. In the summer of 920, Romanus and Nicholas cooperated and made a deal. And what this sort of agreement between them does is that it gives Nicholas something that he wanted, an acknowledgement that his theological position on fourth marriages was correct, while also giving Romanus a way to undermine Constantine's legitimacy without completely destroying it. So what ends up happening is that the church officially condemns fourth marriages, but did not make the matter retrospective, which means that Constantine was accepted on sufferance. So while he is officially emperor, there's kind of an asterisk by his name. 
and that he shouldn't be emperor, but he is. A month later, Roman has decided to get rid of the potential enemies at home, and he accused Zoe of trying to poison him, and then had her shipped back to her convent as Sister Anna. This may very well have been a favor to Nicholas, who hated Zoe, and had already tried to make her Sister Anna once. So perhaps that was part of this deal. Romanus also had Constantine's tutor Theodore sent away, possibly because Theodore now saw that the danger that he had seen in Leo Phocas had been realized in Romanus Lycopinus, who he had clearly underestimated. A few days before his 15th birthday, Constantine probably had to perform one of the most distasteful public ceremonies of his entire life, and his life at this point had consisted of many distasteful public ceremonies that undermined his own interest. Three days before his birthday, on September 24, 920, Constantine placed a crown upon his father-in-law's head and declared him Caesar. This meant that now Romanus Lycopinus was the heir apparent to the Byzantine Empire. A few months later, while Constantine was officially an adult, Romanus was then confirmed as a full Basileus, which means that while he was junior to Constantine by reason of getting his title later, he was now in fact an imperial colleague. So despite the fact that Constantine VII held seniority technically, Romanus actually ends up getting the place of honor on imperial coins, and it was obvious by this point that the coup had been pulled off and that Constantine was no longer a power within the empire. In fact, many people were thinking that Constantine would probably be murdered or die mysteriously or otherwise be forced to renounce his throne. However, that's not what happened, and what we end up having is a very strange reign of Romanus Lycopinus, where he is the emperor and he's governing the empire, but technically he has a senior colleague who is also an adult male from a different family. But we'll get to that story when we get there. And when I cover Romanus Lycopinus, I will cover his entire career, including a recap of much of what we discussed here. And I will also recap some of this information when I eventually do a video on Constantine the Seventh. However, I will not really get to Constantine the Seventh until we have gotten to the part of his life when he is actually governing the empire and not just acting as a rubber stamp for Romanus or other Byzantine officials. Romanus the First Lycopinus was neither the most nor the least successful usurper, but he was perhaps the most interesting. Romanus, just like any other usurper, sought to replace the ruling dynasty, the Macedonian dynasty, with his own family. And in that regard, he ended up failing after a long period of time. He ended up ruling the Byzantine world for 24 years and during that time, he put crowns on the heads of three of his sons, while also instating another son as the Patriarch of Constantinople. In the end, he was actually displaced by the young man he had originally usurped. How did all of that happen? The tale of Romanus is a complex one, and in this video, I hope to unravel it, and also to sort of explore what he did as emperor, uh, where he came from, how he got to the point where he could even put himself up as an imperial candidate. Um, Romanus's career is immensely complex, but it's also important and fascinating. So in this video, we're going to look at Romanus and the Byzantine world between 920 and 944. But before we get into Romanus's reign proper, I think that it is only appropriate that we do something of a recap since the politics of the early 10th century are rather complex and it is worth recontextualizing the situation before we delve into too many details. Leo VI, the father of Constantine the Seventh, had struggled throughout his career to sire a male heir who could take his place when he eventually died. 
To do so, he had to engage in an illegal number of marriages. Finally, he and Zoe Carbonopsina were able to conceive Constantine VII. Unfortunately, Leo died while Constantine was very young, and this meant that Constantine's legitimacy was a real issue. Had Leo lived long enough, he could have put enough of his favorites in positions that Constantine's legitimacy would have not been seriously challenged. As it was, however, he had only really gotten Constantine recognized right before he died, and there were still some people who thought that Constantine's ascension would be something of an aberration and even an offense against religion and decency. For those reasons, but also because Byzantium found itself in a pretty intense war with Simeon of Bulgaria, Constantine and his mother Zoe Carbonopsina were in a tough spot. During this time, um, one of the key contenders for the throne or for influence over the throne was the noble general Leo Phocas. He was the nephew of a far more successful member of the Phocas family who had campaigned in Sicily. He would have possibly become the emperor or the basiliopater had he been a little bit better of a general. However, he suffered some defeats at the hands of the Bulgars, and that tended to slow him down some. Meanwhile, he formed a rivalry with an up-and-coming figure in the Byzantine world, Romanus Lycopinus, who had risen to the rank of Drungarius, the admiral-in-chief of the Byzantine navy. It seems that Leo and Zoe Carbonopsina didn't really take Romanus all that seriously, since he was peasant-born, and they also seem to have really underestimated his cunning and initiative. However, Romanus was not to be someone taken lightly, and he managed to seize the palace in 919. Ironically, given that Romanus's entire political career was dedicated to overthrowing the Macedonian dynasty, the only reason why his family was prominent enough to afford him the opportunities that enabled him to become emperor is precisely because Basil I decided to reward his father, Theophylact the Unbearable. During the reign of Basil I, the emperor was in danger of losing his life at the Battle of Tefriki in 872. During that battle, an Armenian peasant named Theophylact saved the emperor's life and was rewarded for his bravery. Theophylact most likely then served in the Imperial Guard, but he was someone who didn't really have any ambitions, and he also was someone who had never acquired an education. He seems to have been perfectly content as an elite soldier of the Emperor, and someone who would acquire a good amount of wealth for his services. While his son Romanus could not claim to be noble in any meaningful sense, he did start out with some advantages that have been underestimated by modern scholars. A lot of people assume that Romanus shared his father's lack of education because Constantine VII, a very noble and also very educated man, mocked his educational attainments. But the fact is that Romanus did grow up rich and his father had connections at court, so most likely Romanus was a reasonably well-educated man, and he also would have had some connections with senior officials due to his father's fame and his connections in the capital. We don't know the exact date of birth for Romanus, but most likely he was born around the year 870, being very young when his father achieved fame. While he was most likely about two years old at the time that his father saved Basil at Tefriki, most likely Romanus's own self-perception would be that he was the son of a war hero and that had always been the case. While Constantine VII did mock his education and knowledge, as I noted above, Romanus does seem to have received an adequate education. If we look at the course of his career, there are never any indications that he is an ignorant or uninformed person. Early in his life, 
Romanus decided to enter the Imperial Navy. He married a woman named Theodora and she gave birth to eight children, including two who arrived after Romanus's accession to power in 920. Theodora died in 923 and after her death, Romanus would never remarry. Ludprand of Cremona, one of the better sources for the age of Romanus, says that he was on track for high office due to an early display of heroism against the lion. That could be true, but most likely it's simply because he was the son of a war hero and he displayed some talents of his own which made him stand out. So his service in the Navy was something that was bound to achieve him a command and as we'll see that is how things worked out. Romanus's naval service would pay off by the time he reached his 30s. Sometime after 900 but before 910, Romanus was appointed strategos of the theme of Samos which included most of the western coast of Asia Minor and some of the neighboring islands. This area was strategically crucial since it gave Romanus the chance to defend against piracy and Arab attacks. It was also on the path to Constantinople for an invading fleet coming out of, say, Syria. So this meant that Romanus was on the front lines of defense were there to be a major offensive by sea against the Byzantine Empire. In addition to the strictly military applications of his post, Romanus also was able to gain considerable administrative experience, and this is especially useful since the territory he was governing was not all geographically connected, so his task was a somewhat more complex one. When the previous Drungarius Himerius was disgraced in 912, Romanus was appointed to replace him. And this would be the office that he would need to challenge Leo Phocas and others for preeminence in the state. Now that we have fully established who Romanus is and where he came from, let us return to the recap of the years leading up to 920 and just focus in on the many actions that Romanus had to take between 919 and 920 to come to the throne. During that time, over the course of about a year and a half or so, Romanus seized the palace, had Constantine VII marry his daughter Helena, he defeated and killed Leo Phocas, he sent Zoe Carbonopsina to a convent, he became Caesar, or Junior Emperor, he passed the Thomas Unionus to soft, delegitimize Constantine, this basically said that the kind of union which had produced Constantine was illegal and should always be illegal, but that the empire would recognize Constantine as a kind of exception. So basically, Constantine would be allowed to rule, but everybody kind of knew that technically he probably shouldn't be. Romanus also managed to cultivate a friendship with Patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, someone who had initially opposed the marriage and then the legitimation of young uh, Constantine VII. And uh, Romanus had managed to banish people who were supportive of young Constantine, like his tutor Theodore. So by 920, Constantine VII was effectively in the hands of Romanus and had no one else to turn to for advice or help. On September 24, 920, uh, Romanus completed his usurpation by having Constantine crown him as full emperor while Constantine was just a few months shy of achieving his 15th birthday and the age at which he could rule in his own name. Despite Romanus being named as a co-senior emperor, Constantine remained technically senior, even though he never really got to exercise power during this entire period between 920 and 944. Even early on, Romanus quickly gained priority on coins, whereas Constantine faded into the background on the state's official issue. The difference between a usurper and a dynast is that a dynast is capable of passing on the crown to his sons and future successors, whereas a usurper is a one-off ruler. 
Romanus was determined to go from being a usurper to a fully legitimate emperor whose sons and grandsons would one day rule the Byzantine world. Now, after his face started appearing on coins in lieu of Constantine's, everyone naturally assumed that there would be an announcement that Constantine had mysteriously died because Romanus would put him out of his misery. The other thing is that Constantine was legitimately sickly, so it would be relatively hard to prove foul play. The path was perfect. All Romanus needed to do was eliminate his son-in-law, and then he was the only legitimate ruler of the Byzantine world. Yet he didn't do that. Romanus's methods proved to be more subtle, and he tried to more or less soft substitute the rule of the Lecopony for the Macedonian dynasty in a way that he could cloak in legitimacy as much as possible. Constantine VII, for his part, would later claim to have suffered some indignities and insults and to have really hated his father-in-law, but it is clear from Constantine's own complacence during this 24-year period that Romanus was careful not to push him too far and drive him to desperation. Another factor we can't forget is that Constantine and Helena shared a genuine affection and that this prevented Constantine from wanting to take vengeance or engage in revolutionary activity against his father-in-law. So Constantine was in check, but while Constantine was alive, Romanus couldn't really be a dynast since there was a living, empowered representative of the dynasty that was currently considered to be the legitimate ruling house of the empire. Romanus came close to completing his consolidation of power, but he missed a very important step, and of course this will come back to haunt him, although it will take 24 years to do so. Rather than demoting or assassinating Constantine the Seventh, Romanus more or less just watered down his prestige by appointing his sons Christopher, who came to the throne in 921 and died in 931, Stephen and Constantine, both of whom came to power in 924 and lasted until 944 or early 945 technically. Um, one quick note about Christopher, he was the man that Romanus really wanted to succeed him and when Christopher died prematurely, that really threw a wrench in Romanus's succession plans, especially once his other two sons proved to be unworthy of the imperial dignity. Combined with Romanus's successes as emperor, this spreading around of imperial power and abstention from harming the heir to a popular and established dynasty further entrenched and legitimized Romanus's own rule. Later on, Romanus was also able to elevate another son, Theophylact, to be emperor, uh, patriarch of Constantinople in 933. While Romanus is mostly known for his usurpation and for his foreign wars, he also attempted to implement some domestic reforms which are worth mentioning. Let's first look at the problem that Romanus seems to have been among the first to recognize, the rise of the Dunatoi. The Byzantine aristocracy, the Dunatoi, or powerful, had been using the relative peace and prosperity of the past century or so to expand their land holdings at the expense of the Byzantine peasantry. How did they do this? Well, unlike peasants who rarely had much of a surplus or reserve, the Dunatoi were not as affected by invasions, raids, droughts, etc., and they could effectively profit from crisis. So when a crisis like this would occur, a peasant farmer might be ruined and need to get money in a hurry to feed his family. Well, a Dunatus could then offer that peasant money in exchange for his land. So this led many peasants to sell their lands in a desperate bid to save their family in the short term. What this means is that the Dunatoi are rising in terms of relative prestige to the state itself, that they are undermining the land basis of the theme system, 
for providing manpower and that they are potentially creating a disenfranchised and potentially subversive or dangerous crowd of peasants who feel like they have been cheated in some way. So the Dunatoi were a potentially serious threat to the stability of the empire, and it looks like Romanus is the first to pick up on that and to therefore champion the cause of the Byzantine peasantry. Romanus seems to have understood the problem of peasants being displaced by selling their land and the problem presented by the rise of the Dunatoi, but his solution for all of this was rather tepid and inadequate. His solution, which he began to implement as early as 922, was the system of protimesis or priority to regulate who could stake a claim to peasant land when it was put on the market. Peasants had to first offer their land to a relative or neighbor before they could start fielding offers from the wealthy. This law was reissued many times, so it clearly was not well enforced, and as Byzantinist Tim Gregory observed, it did not address the underlying issues of why peasants were putting their land on the auction block in the first place and why they were only able to sell to rich people i.e. Romanus does not seem to have understood that peasants were poor and that they were disproportionately affected by things like raids, droughts, and invasions. So um, this was an inadequate solution, but it did kind of lay the groundwork for future emperors like Basil II to engage in more broad sweeping reform which would defend peasants from the encroachments of the Dunatoi. When he first came to power, Romanus found himself in the middle of a pretty bitter struggle with Simeon of Bulgaria. Simeon at this time was pressing hard into Byzantine holdings in the Balkans and was trying to capture or at least badly damage Constantinople, making several attempts on the city in Romanus's early reign. Romanus tried to make peace with Simeon, offering to pay tribute to end the war, but he would not accept Simeon's demand to be recognized as an equal and a fellow emperor. Militarily at a disadvantage, Romanus sought to avoid direct confrontations and to use diplomacy to keep Simeon at bay. It's not clear if Romanus had any real grand strategy for defeating Simeon, or if he was just searching for small openings here and there and hoping that an opportunity would present itself where he could finally rid himself of the threat of Bulgaria. My guess is that he didn't really have a plan and that he was just looking for openings as they might present themselves. The first three or four years of Romanus's reign were arguably among the worst of his time on the throne. All of his efforts to slow down or stop Simeon and the Bulgars went poorly during this period. In 919, just as Romanus was trying to establish his authority in Constantinople, Simeon was at the city's gates. In 921, Simeon actually occupied the suburb of Caserti near the land walls. On the European shore of the Bosphorus in 922, the Byzantines suffered an embarrassing defeat, and Simeon then proceeded to sack Stenum and burn one of Romanus's favorite palaces. In 923, Simeon took Adrianople after a tough siege and then tortured to death the governor, Moralian, for putting up such a fight. So, while perhaps the remaining Byzantine forces were inspired by the conduct of the garrison of Adrianople, Romanus had lost a capable subordinate in Moralian, so this was not much of a moral victory if it was won at all. Despite all of these victories by Simeon, the fact remained that he couldn't compel Romanus to do all that much because he couldn't take Constantinople. It was simply too great of a fortress for him to take without the assistance of a great fleet. 
Therefore, Simeon resolved to make a land air assault in 924 with the aid of the Fatimid fleet from Egypt. However, unfortunately for Simeon's grand assault, it never materialized. As the envoys were on their way back to Bulgaria, Romanus managed to intercept them and break up the plan that Simeon had been trying to form. He won over the Arab envoys with presents and the promise of an annual tribute, something that was more tangible than the vague promises that Simeon had offered to these same men earlier. When Simeon arrived at Constantinople, he was dismayed by the lack of a Fatimid fleet, and he requested a meeting with Romanus, knowing that he would not be able to take the city by either assault or siege without the fleet that he had intended to have for this campaign. Due to the intercession of the aging patriarch Nicholas Mysticus, there was an actual face-to-face -face meeting between Romanus and Simeon. The two rulers would meet on a specially constructed pier at the northern end of the Golden Horn, and before they met, both of them exchanged a large number of hostages in order to ensure their mutual good behavior. Perhaps Simeon was aware of the kind of tricks that previous emperors had tried to play on unsuspecting foreign rulers who met to parley in this way. When they met, Romanus lectured Simeon on Christian morals. Um, as we'll see, Romanus was very religious, and most likely he was not just doing grandstanding to try to gain some kind of political upper hand, but he thought that he was really speaking truth to power in some way. However, despite Romanus's high-flung rhetoric, he did agree to pay a large tribute, including 100 silk robes, in exchange for Simeon vacating his Black Sea forts. During the parley, two eagles circled, one over Thrace and one over Constantinople. The people who interpreted signs from the gods, or at least from the heavens, decided that the two eagles circling around represented that it was destiny for there to be two empires in the Balkans. However accurate this reading of the flight of two different eagles turned out to be, the fact remains that Simeon never again invaded Byzantine territory. However, there was no way for Romanus to know that Simeon wouldn't be back, and for the next couple of years he had to keep his primary focus on Europe. During this time, it was obvious that Simeon wanted to provoke Romanus into renewing the conflict and that he hoped to win fresh victories at the expense of the Byzantines. Romanus, for his part, doesn't want to be provoked and led into a war that he doesn't think he'll win. In 925, contrary to what they had just agreed upon, Simeon declared himself Basileus of both the Romans and the Bulgars. Previously, he had been content to try to get his rival to recognize that he was the Basileus of the Bulgars, and now he's expanded his reach to claim that he also rules over the Roman people. Romanus, for his part, joked that if Simeon were so inclined, he could also call himself the Caliph of Baghdad. It would make no real difference, since he clearly was not that. The next year, still hoping to bait Romanus into a war that might not favor him, Simeon declared the independence of the Bulgarian church. Romanus's government actually did not respond to this claim, as they thought that responding would in some way legitimate or reward Simeon for his actions. If you've watched my previous couple of videos, you realize that Simeon was one of the most formidable enemies that Byzantium ever faced, and that he had been a problem for Leo, Alexander, and the Council of Regency before Romanus had taken over. So it's worth looking at how Simeon met his end. After failing to provoke Romanus and the Byzantines, Simeon managed to get himself bogged down with wars in the Western Balkans. 
After putting down the Serbs, Simeon sent one of his generals against the nascent kingdom of Croatia. At this time, Croatia was a Byzantine ally ruled by King Tomislav. Tomislav was able to win a great victory in 926 and even to force an unfavorable peace upon Simeon, who then died early the next year, 927, at the age of 69. Simeon had proven himself to be one of, if not the greatest rulers that Bulgaria would ever produce, and aside from his late career defeat in Croatia, he had been quite successful and could even claim to have been one of the best rulers of his entire period, full stop. But our story's not about Simeon, it's about Romanus. From a Byzantine perspective, the most significant thing about the death of Simeon of Bulgaria is that it enabled peace to break out between Byzantium and Bulgaria and would eventually allow Romanus to shift his focus elsewhere. Simeon's successor was a son by his second marriage named Peter, who was still a minor at this time. Peter's government wanted to make a permanent settlement with Byzantium and to avoid any more protracted and expensive wars. To achieve this, the two sides decided to make a marriage alliance between the ruling families of each empire. Peter was married to Christopher Lycopinus' daughter Maria at Mesembria in a ceremony run by the new patriarch Stephen II. Now, our sources for the most part were overwhelmed with the grandeur and splendor of this wedding, and they seem to have kind of ignored some of the other points of significance about it. This was, however, the first time that a Byzantine ruler had married outside of the empire, and because of this, it was celebrated greatly. Or I should say, a foreign ruler had married a Byzantine princess, since Peter was in fact a Bulgarian and not a Byzantine ruler. There appears to have been some form of tribute that Byzantium agreed to pay to Bulgaria, but it is quite possible that this was just an income for the new Empress Maria Irene and her upkeep. Peter, whom Romanus insisted on calling the Archon of Bulgaria, Archon is just a Greek word for a leader, it's fairly generic and nondescriptive, ruled peacefully for 42 years. Once Peter is gone, then old patterns of behavior between uh, Byzantium and Bulgaria will break out, meaning that they will go to war with one another, but for the next 42 years, Romanus and his immediate successors will have peace and they will be able to use that peace to do other things. Shortly after being rid of his empire's long-term rival, Romanus found himself facing a kind of natural crisis in the capital at Constantinople. The winter of 928 was especially brutal and our sources claim that it was the longest and coldest in the history of Constantinople. During this winter, and in line with his reputation as a gentle ruler who despised bloodshed and unnecessary suffering, Romanus personally directed the emergency food supply to make sure that his citizens were able to eat and survive the winter. So when people say that Romanus was a gentle usurper, they don't just mean that he was kind to the people in power, but that he also had some kind of compassion and much more of a heart than most rulers in the medieval period. After 927, Romanus was free to shift his attention to the east, where there were greater opportunities than there were in the Balkans. Now, while he was dealing with the threat of Simeon, Romanus had actually created a truce with the Caliph in Baghdad in 924, knowing that he didn't have the resources to spare on the east and wanting to free up troops for operations in the west. After he made Peter his son-in-law and gained an ally rather than an enemy on the imperial throne of Bulgaria, 
Romanus was free to shift his attention back to the east where there were greater opportunities. Byzantine armies had generally held the initiative since at least the time of Leo VI, if not before, and for Romanus and his contemporaries, Leo's action in annexing the province of Mesopotamia was an inspiration and a model. That action had marked the first real major frontier adjustment in about 200 years, where Leo had outright annexed an entire theme at the expense of his foreign foes. So, for Romanus and others, they would like to emulate that and do it again. After 926, Romanus would be directing the empire's resources to eastern expansion, and he would be aided in this by the very division among the various Muslim powers. There were a number of emirates in the region which were more or less independent. Nominally, all of them were subordinate to the Abbasid Caliph in Baghdad, but in reality, most of them were operating independently and did little more than pay lip service and occasional tribute to the Caliph. Despite acquiring his reputation on the basis of his physical bravery and rising to prominence as a military commander, Romanus rarely served in the field after he became emperor. In fact, it's quite probable that he never really commanded an army once he assumed the crown. Perhaps he just had too many potential enemies in Constantinople, such as the young Constantine VII, who was by this point a man and could potentially cause problems if he were so minded. Because of that, and possibly just because he didn't want to command armies for whatever reason, Romanus turned to his friends. One of his best friends and longest serving allies was John Kirkowas. He had been instrumental in rounding up a lot of the potential subversives in Constantinople when Romanus first took power. By 923, Kirkowas was serving in a command in the east. That year, he was able to finish off Leo of Tripoli, who had been the commander who had destroyed Thessalonica back in 904. Leo of Tripoli, just to recap, was actually a Greek who had been captured at some point by Arab forces. He had converted to Islam, and he had essentially been a successful pirate for many years. Kirkowas finally wiped him out, and in so doing, he instantly became a hero. Kirkowas spent six years consolidating the Byzantine hold on Armenia, culminating in the capture of Manzikert in 932. By this point, of course, Romanus had directed most of his resources east, whereas Kirkowas' earlier accomplishment was done with a partial army since Romanus had the bulk of his resources in the west. So now Kirkowas has a free hand and many troops to work with. His greatest achievement during his Armenian campaign was, as I mentioned, the capture of the city of Manzikert in 932. That city has some other, I guess, meanings in Byzantine history, but those meanings are all in the future, and for now, the capture of Manzikert will sound like a pretty great achievement. This gave the Empire control of the north shore of Lake Van, and control of the routes into central Armenia and beyond. So, what this did was effectively give the Byzantines much more control over the Armenians, and more routes they could take to raid and attack their enemies while also depriving their enemies of routes to invade Byzantine territory. So while this is not a spectacular gain, it's still pretty worthwhile, and it's something that will have some positive consequences down the line. Two years after capturing Manzikert, Kirkowas focuses attention further south in the region of Melitene. On May 19, 934, his forces completed the conquest of the Emirate of Melitene. To consolidate this gain, colonists of Greek and Armenian origin were rushed into the area in order to make sure that there were loyal subjects to garrison and defend this region. While, as I mentioned earlier, there had been previous times where Byzantine forces had captured different areas from various Arab emirates, this was the first time that Byzantium had actually just attacked and conquered an entire Arab emirate. So this does show that Byzantium as a whole was growing in strength relative to its enemies, 
and that Byzantium had found a new great general in John Kirkawas. In fact, it was probably around this time that people began to whisper that Kirkawas was a latter-day Belisarius. The conquest of Melitene was a great victory for Byzantium, no two ways about it. However, it did have the effect of creating some degree of unity and cohesion on the other side that had not existed before. After the fall of Melitene, a new leader on the Islamic world would emerge, and he would prove to be far more capable and organized than most of the people whom the Byzantines had been fighting in the recent past. He was the Emir of Mosul, his name was Saif al Dawla, and he is known as the Sword of the Dynasty. He would prove quickly to be about equal to Kirkuas as a general, and the two men would find themselves locked in a battle that neither could win. For the next six or so years, the two men traded blows back and forth without any real successes on either side. However, in the year 940, something happened when both men happened to be recalled to their respective capitals because of more serious crises. Um, the Caliph of Baghdad called for Saif to come there and help him deal with a crisis further east. And while Baghdad's authority was typically not respected that much, in this case, he managed to get the best general in the Islamic world at that time to come. For um, Kirkawas, there was another threat at Constantinople, and Romanus was recalling him, but we'll get to that in a moment. Kirkawas, for his part, would be away from the east from 940 to 942, whereas Saif's absence would extend until at least 945. The crisis which drew Kirkawas away from the eastern frontier is known as the Rus-Byzantine War of 941. Earlier in the time of Leo VI, there had also been a conflict with the Rus, but they had been relatively quiet for the last 30 years. Now, Grand Prince Igor of Kiev sailed with a thousand ships, that number is from Ludprand of Cremona, someone in Italy who had a lot of knowledge about diplomacy and had spent time in Constantinople. He was also the stepson of an ambassador who happened to be present in 941. His number is most likely accurate, or at least within the ballpark. There are Greek sources which actually claim that there were 10 to 15,000 ships that were with Igor but that is literally impossible based on the production abilities of the period, uh, logistics, the availability of manpower. I mean, a whole lot of things prevent 10 to 15,000 ships from being possible. Um, not to mention that it would be impossible to control that size of a force. Um, mo if you literally did raise 10,000 ships in the medieval world, you were condemning the vast majority of the men on those ships to death due to logistical issues, the impossibility of anchoring that many ships during a storm, etc., etc. But let's not get too sidetracked. Whatever the actual number, we'll go with a thousand. Romanus knew the severity of the crisis, and therefore he decided to recall his fleets. Bardos Phocas, the brother of Leo Phocas, and one of his other major commanders, and John Kirkawas. So at that time, Romanus had been pressing for defensives all over the place, but he knew that he had to defend his capital. Perhaps Igor had learned of the location of the Byzantine forces and thought that he could sail along the Black Sea and strike before Romanus would be ready. For his own part, the emperor readied some old ships. He took 15 retired vessels, hurriedly patched them up, and then equipped them with Greek fire. The good thing about Greek fire, of course, is that when you're fighting wooden ships, something that can cause ships to catch on fire could be a game changer and a force multiplier. Now, what Romanus supposedly did was pretty clever. He instructed his commander to sell out to meet the, Ru the Rus vessels. And because he despised the small number of vessels and he could tell that they were older and kind of beaten up, Igor just thought he would surround and capture these vessels, take the crews prisoner, and learn about um, Romanus' plans and what he could expect in terms of city defenses. But instead, he got Greek fire. 
So this destroyed a number of Igor's vessels. It hardly crippled his fleet, but it probably was pretty demoralizing and embarrassing, while also providing a bit of a moral boost to the Byzantines. Greek fire, of course, was still a wonder weapon, and it was something that would have, uh, you know, made Igor a little more cautious and bought some time for the rest of the Byzantine forces to arrive. Following the Greek fire incident, Igor decided to focus his efforts on Bithynia, a relatively prosperous area to the east of Constantinople on the Asian side of the Bosporus. He was getting a lot of plunder from this area when Bardas Phokas and his army arrived and contained the threat. Igor was occupied by Bardas and he was struggling for control of the region and trying to continue gaining plunder. We are told by our sources, who are admittedly highly biased, that the depredations of the Rus were brutal and almost unspeakably horrible, even when compared to depredations they had faced at the hands of other foes in the past. Feelings are running high. Now, while Igor is fighting in Bithynia, Kirkawas's army also arrives, and Theophanes, who is now the main fleet commander, arrives with the bulk of the Byzantine navy. Igor realized too late that he had been trapped by these two armies in the fleet, so what he tries to do is break out before all is lost. However, Theophanes happened to have even more Greek fire, and once again the Byzantines will inflict a frightful toll on Igor's navy. While the first naval battle near Constantinople was probably not really that devastating, just more demoralizing, this one was. We don't know the exact casualty figures, but supposedly very few Rus were able to escape. And while there were many who were taken prisoner, most of them were not granted quarter, but instead were slain on the spot for the rape, pillage, and plunder that they had been inflicting on Bithynia for the past several months. With the threat of the Rus temporarily dealt with, Romanus was able to dispatch his main field armies and fleets back to their respective campaigns. John Kirkawas arrived back in the east in early 942, quickly striking at the city of Aleppo and managing to carry off 10 to 15,000 prisoners. While he did not actually capture Aleppo, this was still a major victory as this would have given him quite a lot of campaign funding since he sold these prisoners or ransomed them back. In the fall of that same year, Edessa offered Kirkawas a holy relic in exchange for their safety. So, um, Kirkawas thought that was a pretty fair deal, and he left them to their own devices while they negotiated this agreement with the Caliph. As the leader of the faith of Islam, the Caliph was the person who would have to approve of such a transaction. So this would take a while, but Kirkawas was confident that he would continue to win battles around Edessa and hold them to this bargain. While the negotiations were going on between the citizens of Edessa and the Caliph, Kirkawas continued to campaign in that region. Over the next year and a half, he managed to capture the key city of Dara and some other places that the Byzantines had not held since 641 during the initial Islamic invasions of the region back when Heraclius had been emperor. The holy relic that the Edessans possessed was the Mandilion of Christ. This is supposedly a rag on which he wiped his face and left an impression of it. In the spring of 944, Edessa finally handed over the Mandilion to Kirkawas, who then forwarded the object to Constantinople for official consecration. When it arrived for its enshrinement at the Hagia Sophia, Romanus was too ill to attend the ceremony, so the emperors who attended it instead were his two surviving imperial sons and Constantine VII. Now, as I mentioned earlier, his two sons who survived after Christopher's death were not necessarily of the highest quality. However, Constantine VII was a scholar in his own right and someone who would fully appreciate the importance of such a relic. The following story most likely owes a lot to propaganda that Constantine VII himself wrote down at some point 
or ordered someone else to write down. However this story came to us, the story goes that when the Mandelian was presented to the three emperors, the two Lecopini were not able to see Christ's face because they were not sufficiently learn, learned or pious. However, Constantine was able to see the face because he was the rightful ruler. Someone in the audience apparently noticed that two of the emperors could not see the face of Christ, but that the rightful heir to the throne could, and that led him to shout for Constantine to claim his birthright. Now, the story, given its timing and the fact that someone is calling for Constantine to become emperor in his own right without his father-in-law or brothers-in-law is a little too close for coincidence, a little too on the nose, but it does make for an interesting story. Shortly following the return of the Mandilian to Constantinople, Romanus received word that Igor was coming back with another large fleet looking for revenge and plunder. However, the aging Romanus I Lycopinus decided in one of his final imperial acts of note to instead make peace. He figured that it would be cheaper to grant concessions to the Rus than to fight them on a large scale again and possibly risk having them lay waste to one of his prosperous themes. So he sent ambassadors to meet with the Grand Prince on the Danube and buy him off by granting trade concessions, visitation rights to Constantinople for the Rus, extradition arrangements for fugitives, escaped slave laws, and other mostly minor things that were far better than having to fight the Rus in another pitched battle. Romanus by this point was perhaps wise enough to realize that while he had won heavily the last time, when you're fighting on a large scale like that, the outcome is never all that predictable and there's a lot of risk involved. So he thought that this was a low risk, high reward strategy. Around the same time, the Pechenegs were about to raid Byzantine territory, and Romanus decided once again to use diplomacy rather than force. Instead of fighting them off, he simply offered them a bribe if they would redirect their raid against Bulgaria instead of Byzantium. His grandson-in-law, Peter of Bulgaria, was no doubt not happy with Romanus's diplomacy in that regard, but Romanus had saved the Byzantines from a lot of unnecessary trouble, and this allowed his generals to continue to do their good work on the frontier, rather than having to rush back to fend off a threat at the capital. While Romanus's actions in dealing with Igor's return in 944 show that he was still fairly sharp and certainly rational, he did experience quite a bit of decline in his later years, and much of that decline was not so much a drop-off in his intellectual capacity as simply a drop-off in his spirits and his ability to stay focused on this world and this life. In his last years on the throne and in the years following, spoiler alert, he does have a post-imperial career, Romanus was increasingly preoccupied with the fate of his immortal soul spending a disproportionate amount of his time in private meetings with monks discussing his immortal soul. By this point, I'm sure that Romanus's primary source of depression was that his planned Lycopony dynasty was not going to happen. His oldest, favorite, and most capable son Christopher had died young in 931, and his two other sons, Stephen and Constantine, had proven to be unworthy of the imperial dignity. Romanus, as someone who seems to have genuinely cared about the well-being of the empire and doing what was right for the public, we've seen that in some of his previous actions, such as when he directed the food supply back in 928, knew that he owed it to the people of Byzantium to give them an emperor who was worthy of the office. And the person who was the most worthy was his son-in-law, the man he had deposed in the first place, Constantine the Seventh. So as he realized that, he realized that his dynasty wasn't going to happen and that he had been merely a caretaker who had inserted some of his genetics via his daughter. That wasn't a mean accomplishment, but if you had been a sitting emperor for 24 years and you knew that your legacy would just be as the father-in-law of an emperor, ultimately, 
that's pretty depressing. According to the sources, Romanus was also feeling a great deal of guilt about his usurpation of Constantine's throne. Personally, I'm very doubtful that he had guilt about that, um, unless it was because of how he had failed to provide an heir who was superior to Constantine. I seriously doubt that he was now having a lot of reservations about his initial plan, merely the way that it had turned out. I'm sure that Constantine himself probably inserted that little part in to show that Romanus actually wasn't that great of a guy and that he, Constantine, should have been in charge the whole time. But whatever the reason and whatever his precise uh, source of anxiety and source of depression, it's clear that Romanus was not a happy man in his later years and that he was brooding and deeply distressed about the fate of his immortal soul. It seems that, for whatever reason, Romanus thought that the end was nigh for him in 944. As I mentioned earlier, he was too ill to attend the return of the Mandilian to the Hagia Sophia. So perhaps he thought that the illness was more serious than it was at that time, and this led him to call for a wave of new legislation. He thought that if he passed the right laws, that this could sort of give him a better chance of saving his soul. He decided to remit all government rents in the capital and cancel all debts. That wasn't necessarily good for the public treasury, but it did gain him some popularity, as well as uh, you know showing his charity for the needy. He decreed that every Jew and Armenian in the capital had to either convert to orthodoxy immediately or face expulsion. Um, it was fairly common for people to be persecuted on religious grounds in the ancient and medieval worlds, and in the case of Romanus's sort of limited persecution here, it was a very selfish one. He apparently had not been bothered by religious diversity before this, but he thought that if he just stood up hard enough for the church at the expense of thousands and thousands of people, that this would help his soul. So it was a purely selfish move, and I'm sure that the lives of thousands of people were ruined because they had to relocate from the capital to some other place where they didn't have the same means to make a livelihood. The biggest announcement that he made, though, in terms of its long-term impact was when he publicly announced that when he died, his primary successor would be not his two sons, but rather his son-in-law, Constantine VII, Porphyrogenitus. And because he'd announced that in public, his sons were aware that they were not going to inherit the empire. So you can imagine that their response was not a positive one, and this would create yet more problems. The two Lacopany brothers, Stephen and Constantine, decided to mount a coup against their father in order to save their own positions from their brother-in-law, Constantine. Their coup was insufficient, but it was a little bit on the bold side. It was incompetent, but yet it had a certain amount of energy to it. I suppose you could compare it to the Bay of Pigs over a thousand years later. At any rate, this coup would last for a couple of weeks. The two Lacopany brothers arrested and deposed their father, sending him off to a monastery on the prince's islands. At this time, they also tried to arrest Constantine VII, but there was public support for him, and a crowd gathered outside of the palace and demanded to see him to make sure that he was safe. He waved to the crowd. That sort of deterred uh, the crowd from storming the palace. And then the two brothers realized that killing Constantine would not be an option. So they were kind of in charge now, but they also had a third partner they didn't want. And it was just not a comfortable situation. They didn't know how to resolve it. Ultimately, it would be another Lacopany family member who would break the stalemate. Helena, their sister, who was also Constantine the Seventh's wife, eventually convinced her husband that he was the rightful heir and that the public was on his side. So Constantine finally sent out orders to arrest and depose his two brother-in-laws. They were then sent to join their father, Romanus, at the monastery. 
When they arrived, Romanus taunted them with a Bible verse about disobedient sons. By this point, he had become even more religious and even more focused on his soul's fate. Given the increasingly morbid interest of Romanus, perhaps it was for the best that he was deposed from his office and given more time to concentrate on what death would bring for him. Now he was freed from any official responsibilities and could spend all of his time thinking about and talking about his soul and his sins. In 946, Romanus wrote down all of his sins and then sent the book off to some monks living at Mount Olympus to fast for two weeks and pray for his soul. Supposedly, the monks heard a voice from heaven saying that the prayer was granted, and then when they opened up the book, they found that all of the pages had gone blank. So, according to the monks who were friends with Romanus, his sins had all been forgiven, and he would not in fact suffer eternal damnation for his acts of usurpation. I suppose that must have been something of a relief to him, but since he had been worrying about this for so long, I imagine that he was still a bit skeptical and probably continued to do more penance for the next couple of years. Whatever Romanus's intentions with regard to his retirement, it does appear that there were still some Lecapini supporters out there who wanted to restore him the power. Keep in mind, he had ruled for 24 years, and he had gained some allies during that time. Not everyone was a Constantine VII fan. Theophanes, the High Admiral, and Patriarch Theophylact were actually caught in the act of trying to organize a plot to restore Romanus to the throne. Theophanes was not related to Romanus, but had been appointed by him, and since he occupied a position that Romanus had once occupied, the position of Drungarius, they might have been close. Patriarch Theophylact was, of course, a son of Romanus, so his desire to see his father return to power requires no real comment. At any rate, though, they were caught early on in this plot, and it never amounted to much, just like the short-lived corporate plot against the FDR early in his administration. Romanus's awareness or approval of this endeavor is unclear. He may not have been aware, and he might not have even approved of it had he known. At any rate, though, Theophylact was forgiven and retained as patriarch for the rest of his life, whereas Theophanes was less lucky. He was just disgraced and then dismissed from office, but surprisingly not executed. On June 15, 948, Romanus I Lycopinus finally died at around the age of 78, and he was interred next to his wife in Constantinople. To be a truly great emperor, one has to be transformative in a way that's positive for one's empire. In that sense, Romanus falls short of greatness. However, he doesn't fall all that short of greatness. As an emperor, he inherited an empire that was prosperous and expanding, and he managed to keep that going. That has to count for something. On the most basic level, Romanus I Lycopinus was a successful emperor who managed to leave a genetic trace on the Macedonian dynasty. He failed as a usurper to establish his own dynasty, the Lycopini, but that was not a loss for the empire as a whole and his usurpation was not an interruption. In fact, his usurpation helped to shore up the state and gave Byzantium an experienced, wise, and capable ruler at a time when it was threatened by Simeon of Bulgaria. His land reforms were a tepid first step to the protections that other 10th century rulers would implement against the Dunatoi and their rising power. Had he taken more proactive steps or dealt with the problem in a way that was more institutional, perhaps he could have been a great emperor. He ushered in an age of peace in the Balkans once Simeon was dead and he created an ally out of Simeon's successor, Peter, and his generals under his direction were able to gain some impressive victories in the east and add territory, at, especially at Melitene. Almost all of the negative press that he has received over the centuries 
is due to the influence of Constantine the Seventh, who was a prolific writer and who bore a serious grudge against his father-in-law, especially for the Thomas Unionists and taking away 24 years of Constantine's time on the throne. That being said, once Constantine came to power, he could have changed anything that he thought was truly objectionable about Romanus's reign. For the most part, other than some shifts in personnel, Constantine VII must have approved the way that Romanus ran the empire, since he actually, as we'll see, changed very little. While he might not have been a scholar, and he might not have had the most fancy education of his day, Romanus was still an intelligent, thoughtful, and highly successful and effective emperor. So, although he's a usurper, he still deserves quite a bit of respect, and of all the usurpers in history, as I commented at the outset of this video, he is both the most and least successful.